Welcome to the first um, video in the series of quantum mechanics. This is the comprehensive approach. Our goal here is to allow all of you to understand quantum mechanics at a fundamental level. To do that, we're going to start with some very basic math. For those of you who already know it, if you're watching this video at a later time, um, feel free to skip the algebra and trig series and go on to learn the complex physics behind quantum mechanics. For now though, we're gonna begin with some basic algebra. The most basic and yet probably one of the most fundamental understandings that can be found in all of mathematics is the study of algebra. The root of algebra lies in the arrangement of variables that have differing effects on the outcome of another variable. This may sound confusing at first, but that is why we are beginning with a singular variable that we will be calling x that will be determining the value of another variable, y. These types of equations, so long as they have a constant change in y for each value of x, are called linear equations. The simplest example of a linear equation is shown here, where y equals x. That means at any point along this graph seen here, the y value, which would be the vertical axis, is the same as the x value, the horizontal axis. In an equation, the independent variables are the variables whose variation does not depend on that of another variable and is typically graphed along the horizontal axis in the situation that is x. The vertical axis then represents the dependent variable whose value does depend on that of another variable. The example that I've shown here has y as the dependent variable along the vertical axes and the x as the independent variable along the horizontal axis. The equation y equals x is a linear equation because it has a constant change in its y value per unit x. In this case, whatever the value of x, the value of y is exactly that. This is because of a property of the equation called slope. The slope is the measure of how steep the graph is as the slope get, gets larger, the change in y per unit x is then larger. Same thing, if it were to get smaller, the change per unit y, or sorry, the change in y per unit x would then get smaller. From this, we can deduce that as our measurement of the change in y value is larger, the slope will be larger. And as the measurement of the change in the x value gets larger, the slope will be smaller in value. An equation is formed from this statement which is that the slope of the line is equivalent to the change in the y value divided by the change in the x value. Symbolically, this is written as slope equals delta y over delta x, where the symbol delta, which looks like a triangle, means change or a small amount of. The variable it lies in front of being the y or the x. is what we're representing a small amount of or change in. A common method in which students remember how to find the slope of a linear equation graph is to divide the rise of the line, which is the change in the y value, how much it goes up, rise, by the run, how far it changes horizontally. This is the rise and this is the run. To do this, one simply just needs to pick two x values and establish them as boundary points. Let's use x equals one. Let's use x equals one and x equals two. These are our boundaries. So we're gonna pick the point in which x equals one intersects with the line, which is here. This coordinate would be denoted as one, one, where the first one is the x coordinate and the second value is the y coordinate. And then we go to the second position where x equals two intersects with the line, and this would be two, two. In order to represent our values here of our slope, we would do the change in y over the change in x. To represent the change in y, 
we need to take the final y value here, which is two, and subtract the first y value from it, being one. The same thing can be done for the x value. Take this, the final x value, two, and subtract the first x value, one. In both these cases, the change is one. So the slope of this line will be equal to one because one over one equals one. Most linear equations aren't this simple, however. The reason they aren't this simple is because they have some starting value as well as a slope that isn't equal to one. And in some cases, the slope isn't even a whole number, meaning a number zero, one, two, three, four, something like that. It may be a number like 4.5 or 4.322222 repeating. These equations are typically used to show some sort of collection of items that start at some given value and either decrease or increase with time at a constant rate. There are separate types of equations that show a system that fluctuates over time or even increases or decreases its slope over the time. But we won't touch on those equations until we get to equations that are of a higher degree. Having the equations be of a higher degree just means that the equations will have things like x to the third power, which looks something like this, which would be of the third degree. The equations that we are focusing on right now are all in the first degree, meaning it's x to the first, which we just show as x. Because to the first, anything to the first power is always equal to itself. You don't have to worry about knowing exponent rules yet. That will come later. To demonstrate the equations whose graph will have a non-one and non-whole number slope that doesn't start at the origin, being the point uh, zero, zero, I will use the equation y equals 2.5x plus three. And this equation may be discouraging at first, but what we need to realize is that it really isn't different from the equations we have done previously. Y are y equals x and y equals 2.5x plus three, the same thing. They look different, right? Truth is, they're really not. The reason is that what y equals x is really telling us is that y equals x plus zero, where the slope is one. So y equals one x plus zero. We're, that would indicate that zero is our starting value. And after that, we increase by one x value and one y value at each interval. This format is called slope-intercept form. And the general array that this can be written is as follows. Y equals mx plus b. In this equation, m is your slope, being the change in y over the change in x. b is what is called the y-intercept. The y-intercept is simply the y-coordinate of the line at the point when x equals zero. And we'll always have the coordinates of zero and then b. To demonstrate this, if the slope of a line is three and, and the y-intercept is at positive seven, then the point of the y-intercept will be zero, seven. And its equation is going to be y equals three x plus seven. Simple enough. Because the slope is equal to three and the y-intercept is equal to seven, this means, as said, at x equals zero, y equals seven. Because when x equals zero, the equation is like this, y equals three times zero 
plus seven. Anything times zero is zero and zero plus seven is seven. So when X is zero, Y is seven. And that fits our coordinates written here. From this observation, we can calculate um, a Y value for all values of X and then put it into a graph where the X value is represented along the horizontal axis and the Y value is represented along the vertical axis. The graph of the equation um, that represented can be seen below. This is the equation Y equals three X plus seven. And this is its graph. As you can see, it's Y intercept or it's starting value right here. This is at 0 0.07. With the graphical representation of this equation, it becomes obvious that it is almost identical to the graph of y equals x, which you see here. The only difference, however, is that it has been moved upward and it has a steeper slope. All linear equations look like y equals x with different m and a different b being the slope and the y-intercept. Although all examples shown by far have been positive slopes and positive y-intercepts, it is very possible for either or both of those values to be negative. One example is shown here with both the slope and the y-intercept being negative. Let me rewrite that just for clarity. Y equals negative four X minus three. Here we see that the y-intercept is at zero, negative three. And if we look closely, it appears to go down by negative four for each value of x that it increases by. The graph of this linear equation shows us how an equation with a negative slope and the y-intercept appears to be a reflection of its positive counterpart. Looking at this graph, we can see that it follows the same rules as the positive equations. What's the difference between them then? Well, if it is an obvious set, the change in y is negative, while well, the change in x remains positive and the starting value is negative. In this situation, there's no need to use the slope equation to determine the slope of line because now it is known. Slope of line is known to be y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope. And here, m is represented by negative four, so we know that the slope must be negative four. No calculations are needed. Now, since the slope is known as well as the y-intercept, the value of y can be determined for every value of x and vice versa. This is a very important trait of these equations and will prove very useful soon. As previously mentioned, the equations can also exist with a negative slope, but a positive y-intercept, as well as with a positive slope, but a negative y-intercept. Examples of both are shown here. This example right here would be a negative slope with a positive y-intercept. It starts at a positive value, but becomes increasingly negative as the x value increases. Uh, an example of a problem with a positive slope and a negative y-intercept can be seen right here. It's the opposite. It starts at a negative value and it increases and becomes positive over the increasing x values. A useful tool used when analyzing graphs is the area under the curve. I'm sure a partial idea can be gathered from that statement, but it will only be a partial idea. The area under the curve is, as it sounds, the area of the space between the graph line and the x-axis. What is noticeable about the space between the graph line, which would be here, this would be the space between the graph line and the x-axis, as would be this. What is noticeable about the space between the graph line and the x-axis is that it resembles a triangle. This will be the case with linear equations and will serve as a practical reference to the familiar concept of finding the area of a triangle in which most of you are familiar. If for some reason the area of a triangle equation is lost or unknown to you, do not worry, I will introduce it. The area of a square or rectangle can be denoted by the equation 
the length of the base multiplied by the length of the height. And that will give you the area of a square or a triangle. In the case of a square, the base and the height are the same value. So for a triangle, it can be considered a equals b squared or a equals h squared, which in this case, assume this is a correctly drawn square, h and b must be equal because it is a square. However, on a rectangle, b would be this value and h would be this value. Either way, you multiply these two values together and that gives you the area for a rectangle and a square. Now, something you'll notice is if I draw a line right here, it becomes two triangles. If two triangles make up the area of a square or of a rectangle, we can say that the area of a triangle equals one half the area of a square or a rectangle. So we could call that one half base times height. On a triangle, it'd be like this. You just do the base times the height and then divide it by two. The B in this, in this equation represents the base, as I said. In this case, the graphs of these linear equations, the value B is represented as the X component. This is your base. So similarly, H is the Y component. It's much similar. H is considered this length as well. Just uh, oop, is this length as well. Being the distance along the Y axis in which that triangle exists. For example, a graph can be formed from the equation y equals x. That's the graph here. This is the equation of y equals x, the very first graph that we looked at. But this one shows this shaded region, which is the area under the curve. And that is, we're going to figure out what the area under the curve is here. To figure out the area under a curve, we have to first decide our boundary conditions in which we are going to find the area under the curve. In this case, we're finding the area under the curve from 0 to 6. If we just say, find the area under the curve of this graph, you're gonna get an infinite number. If we're talking zero to infinity, if we're talking all the numbers on the graph, it'll be zero because it extends beyond the zero line as well. Now, in this instance, our vertical distance here is equal to six. So H equals six. And this horizontal distance is also equal to six. So to find the area of a triangle, we do one half base times height. In this situation, our base is length six and our height is length six. So we get that together and we end up with one half because, and then six times six is 36. One half of 36 is 18. Our area under the curve is 18 units squared. And, and when you do area, it's always going to be unit squared. So we can represent that. If we don't have a known unit, we just say u squared. This equation um, was an example comparable to much of the practical applications of the skill that will be used later on in the quantum mechanics course. However, the knowledge on what to do when a negative area under the curve is measured needs to be established. Sometimes a question or problem may require an evaluation of the area between x equals zero and x equals six. This case um, should be conducted in the same way, but with two different triangles that the area needs to be found for. To evaluate the respective boundary previously stated, the equations of y equals x minus three can be used. This time, a different window of values. The graph of the range of the values can be seen in this figure. Now, this is the, this is the graph of the equation y equals x minus three. And like I said, in this graph, I, I, I probably should have shown it to you as I was speaking. We're evaluating the area under the graph, once again, from x equals zero to x equals six. Now, in this situation, we actually have to find the area of two graphs. Now, what we'll find here is that the area under this curve is a situation, it's quite simple. Like I said, we just gotta find the area of both triangles. Now, what do we do to get the area under the curve? Because surprisingly enough, we don't just add the areas together. There's something special. So 
the first triangle on the left will do first. This has a base length of three. That's this length from here to here, zero to three, length of three. And its height is actually of length negative three because it extends from zero to negative three. This may seem weird thinking of something as a negative length, but it makes sense in terms of the graph. The second triangle on the right has a base length of three and a height of three. Therefore, we can define the areas of the triangles as follows. The left triangle, the area of the left triangle equals one half three times negative three, and that will equal negative 4.5. The area of the right triangle equals one half three times three, which gives you positive 4.5. Now to find the total area under the curve, we add the left area to the right area. which this will be negative 4.5 plus 4.5. And as you will find, the area is zero units squared. So there's no net area under this curve. One may notice that a general rule can be applied. When the defined area lies below the x-axis, it can be considered negative. That would be this or if it, if it lies below zero on the y coordinate, this means that it is negative. If, however, it lies above the x-axis, it is considered positive. That is your general rule. If it lies below the x-axis, it's negative. If it lies above, it's positive. And to find the total area, you add them together once you establish them in the correct signs being either negative or positive. Additionally, remember that the area under the curve for a set range can be defined by the sum of the areas. Like I said, add them together, simple. The ability to obtain the area under the curve will get more complicated in later systems where the curve isn't a simple shape, such as a triangle. It may be a semicircular, structure, but we'll get into the calculus behind finding areas of such curves. Uh, <clears throat> those mathematical tools will be um, well instructed before we get to that point. Finding the area into the curve will prove to be a very important and applicable skill. Because of the significance of the skill, I urge the practice problems that I have left in the description to be undergone. And if you want to make sure you understand it, I really suggest you do them. The practice entails the application of the mathematical tools present throughout this video. If any of the problems feel too confusing, reference this section once more. If it proves to be significantly confusing and unsolvable with the understanding that you've gathered, feel free to turn to the, to the um, next page on the practice problems and you'll see the answers. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and let me know. That is it for this video.